Ingi. Uh, Christian is an award-winning television producer, public speaker, author, peace advocate, and former violent extremist. After leaving the hate movement he helped create during the 1980s and 90s, he began the painstaking process of making amends and rebuilding his life. Christian went on to earn a degree in international relations from DePaul University and launched Gold Mill Group, a counter extremism consulting and digital media firm. In 2016, he won an Emmy Award for producing his anti-hate advertising campaign aimed at helping people disengage from extremism. Since leaving the white power movement, Christian has dedicated his life to helping others overcome their own hate. Now he leads the Free Radicals Project a global extremism prevention and disengagement network. He has spoken all over the world, including TED, the TED stage, and shares his unique and extensive knowledge, teaching all who are willing to learn about, the, about building greater peace through empathy and compassion. Christian chronicles his involvement and exit from the early white supremacist skinhead movement in his memoir, White American Youth. He showcases his disengagement work in his second book, Breaking Hate, Confronting the New Culture of Extremism, published in February 2020 by Hatchet Books, as well as the MSNBC documentary series of the same name. Welcome, Christian. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Angela. It's a real uh, honor to be here. It's also a real privilege to be here considering my past uh, and considering we are still living in a society that uh, doesn't give people of color uh, that same second chance, oftentimes that first chance, unfortunately. So I really take that very seriously and, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you so much. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Um, just like a brief overview. So everybody, we all understand where you are and what was sure. going on. Sure. So uh, I was recruited into the American neo-Nazi skinhead movement when I was 14 years old uh, in 1987. Um, and I spent eight years uh, until I was almost 23 years old as a member and uh, eventually a leader within that movement um, before I disengaged um, in 1996. Uh, it was around 1999 or 2000 when I actually started doing the work, when I finally found the courage to confront what I had been a part of and instead of running from it and, and really kind of face it head on and, and do the work of kind of dismantling what I helped build. Um, but just I think it's really important that before 14, um, I wasn't raised to be a racist. Uh, my parents are actually Italian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the mid-60s, uh, and they were often the victims of prejudice when they, they arrived. Uh, so it wasn't something I was raised with. It's something I learned um, kind of out on the streets because I was searching not for that ideology, uh, but for a sense of identity and community and purpose. And um, as I was searching, you know, in my life's journey, I hit what I call potholes. Uh, and for me, it was kind of the sense of abandonment, but for others, it can be, you know, other kind of marginalizing things that kind of put me on the fringes where there were people ready and waiting with a narrative to, to kind of pull me in. And, and I was, even though I didn't really understand what I was uh, becoming a part of, was very willing to accept it because it, it kind of filled some other voids in, in my life and, and, um, and uh, ultimately was able to get out um, through the compassion of the people that I thought I hated, uh, which is certainly wasn't their responsibility to, to do that. Uh, but I'm very, very grateful that they did. Wow, that's, um, that's really incredible. Um, if anybody has a question, um, in, if you're on Zoom with us, you can just write star star hand up in the chat and then you can, you can ask your own question today because we're not in the webinar module. And if you're on Facebook, uh, just write your question in the comments and uh, I'll pick it up and read it. Um, so while people are gathering their thoughts, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, because I've been uh, totally, I've, I've had a lot of time to look forward to speaking with you over these past few uh, weeks, especially all the stuff that's happened this week. And I mean, even before that, but this week is kind of, I don't know, I have to say this week kind of broke me a little bit. I mean, I've been, I've been handling this, I think, okay, all these attacks on Jewish people, on the Sikhs, on black people. I mean, you know, people are being being attacked all through the Trump administration. 
But this one somehow, I don't know, it just really got to me. Um, so what type of approaches do you find most effective in countering hate-based movements? Um, well, you know, it really, I work mostly with individuals, so I can tell you the tactics that I use there and are different than what I would use on a group of people, um, because, and I'll explain why, because working with an individual one-on-one -on -one allows you to create a safe place where they can be vulnerable, where you can be vulnerable with them. Unfortunately, working with, you know, if I were to walk into a clan meeting and say, hey, you know, let's talk about our feelings, there's not going to be anybody who, who's really going to be willing to do that. So, but one-on-one, -on -one, that's typically my approach. Um, I want to kind of go back to the first part though, of what you said, and, and it really is. And, I, and thank you for saying that. And I'm very, very sorry about how traumatic um, this has been for everybody, but it's important to recognize that this is happening, that this every day we are hearing about more um, violence against people of color, against minority groups, against, uh, you know, uh, religious um, people who are not part of, you know, white Christian America are being attacked. Uh, and, and part of this is because, you know, maybe for the first time in our lives, we're seeing somebody at the very top stoking these fears, uh, putting more, uh, you know, polarization, um, more pressure for polarization, more, you know, ideas of, of blaming the other for what is happening. And that's really, really scary because while we've had, you know, certainly politicians in the past who were less than truthful, um, you know, it's been a really, really long time since we had somebody, at least, you know, maybe the first time in our lives since we've had somebody who was very blatantly encouraging uh, this type of, of reaction. Um, so, you know, it, I'm encouraged somewhat because, you know, Angela, we spoke a little bit before and you said that this is really the, the first time in your life being involved that you've seen so many people, you know, abroad, Democrats abroad want to get involved again, uh, which tells me that, you know, people are starting to, to understand what is happening. Uh, but also, I think we need to be very, very careful because, of course, this is not the end. Um, and certainly uh, even an election, a positive election on November 3rd, which happens to be my birthday. So please bring me something <laughs> nice on my birthday. Um, even if we get a, a positive result on November 3rd, that is not the end. That is simply the beginning uh, of when we can, when we can, we are allowed to finally move in a progressive direction again. Uh, but certainly we have a long way to go. We have a lot uh, you know, I talked a little bit about identity, community, and purpose earlier with my journey and potholes that kind of detoured me to the fringes. Societies can have that same struggle for a sense of identity, community, and purpose. Uh, America, I think, is struggling with that right now. And we also have historical potholes that we have never addressed that have led us to the fringes where we've become radicalized. We have never properly addressed slavery. We've never properly addressed um, kind of uh, the the pattern of, of what slavery has become, criminal justice, uh, we need reform there, and, and, you know, the enslavement of people of color in our prison system, and, and, and you know, it became Jim Crow laws, and now it's been kind of legalized as Jim Crow law. We need to address those historical potholes. We need to repair them if we ever hope to kind of find a more positive sense of identity, community, and purpose. Yeah, that's, uh, that's for sure. We have not addressed anything, and if anything, it seems like you know, um, I was a kid in the 70s and people talked about this kind of stuff, you know, because, okay, it was the 70s and people, there were movements about women's rights, gay rights, African-American rights, and people talked about, about these things. But slowly over time, you know, there's less of a conversation about how the past affects the present and how if we don't fix it, it will affect the future. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know if we'll ever, I mean, we, we can do it, but it would take some, um, it would take some work. I have, well, uh, I can, I can tell you, and I see a question, you know, people are asking, how do we do this? Right. And, and I can tell you that the way I do it with an individual is by repairing those potholes first and foremost, right? We have, we have to create a strong foundation to find our way again, before we even attempt to find our way again. And part of that is addressing head on, um, the things that have happened in our history, things like slavery, thing we have to address the fact that even our history is being taught differently depending on where you grow up in America. Uh, you know, if I've 
speak all over the country, all over the world. And it's, it strikes me every time I speak to young people, you know, kind of off the kind of sidebar conversations, I'll ask them, you know, how did you learn about, um, you know, what, it, what caused the civil war? You know, if you, if I'm talking to somebody in Alabama and they'll say, well, you know, we learned it was about Northern aggression and, and things like that. And, you know, I'll talk to somebody in Minnesota and say, how did you learn about it? And they'll say, well, it was about, about slavery and, you know, the fight against, and it's, we're not even teaching our own history, uh, in many cases, the right way or in a full way. So I think it starts there. Uh, I also think it starts by addressing uh, uncertainty because uncertainty is really what drives thoughts of extremism. Uh, and you know, and when I say thoughts of extremism, that could mean suicide. That's self harm. That's an extremism to self. Uh, it could cause you know violence to other people. It could you know solve uh, why young people are maybe joining gangs or why people are are getting addicted to drugs and things like that. We need to address all of these issues of healthcare, of education, mm -hmm. of uh, well being for for you know every American. Uh, we need to stop marginal marginalizing people further and instead bringing them closer into the fold. That doesn't mean meeting in the middle into like what we see our vision of America is, but bringing them in so we can understand what the vision of America is, because I don't think any of us really know that. Um, so, yeah, that's yes. true. Um, we have a question from Facebook uh, from Matthew Rose. He'd like to know sure. what sort of language is acceptable and persuasive in dealing with Trump supporters? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, I, you know, and I would say, um, I do a lot more listening than I do preaching or speaking. Uh, so when I'm working with an individual and I'm really trying to understand why they think a certain way now, it's important for me to understand the motivations, not of just that, but of a lot of other things in their life too. You know, why they live a certain way, where, you know, why, where they live and why they live there, um, what they choose to do with their life, you know, what kind of historical potholes they may have encountered that led them uh, to, you know, want to latch on to those types of solutions. So after I listen, it gives me a better understanding of how to approach them uh, when I start to speak or when I start to ask questions. And I'll ask questions about, um, you know, their life. Um, and, and this is kind of the trick. Um, and take a step back a little bit. The trick is for me to really kind of build a common um, and fundamental understanding of each other. So it's a lot of talk about family, children, what they find important in those, leaving politics out of that. So it's really about building rapport, right? But while we're building reports about establishing those commonalities that we both have, we both want our children to be healthy and happy and, and safe. We want them to, to you know, have a, an education and jobs. We want to be healthy. We want our families to be, you know, to have, be productive members of society. We start with those kinds of conversations. It will get political and go off track, but there's always that reference point to come back to that is not political. Right. Uh, if we start out on opposite ends, unfortunately, we may never find that way to get to that commonality in the middle. Uh, so we will always find ourselves trying to, you know, kind of fend each other off. Um, and I think that that's something we need to, to do. So, I mean, if we're certainly, you know, I want to talk about Trump supporters, you know, they're not all Nazis and, and white nationalists. They've made really poor choices, I think, in, in who they've elected. But, um, you know, I, my, I'll be honest, my in-laws, my wife's parents voted for, for Donald Trump. They're lifelong Republicans. They really are the nicest people I've ever met. You know, I trust them with my life and, and they're kind and, and generous and, you know, military, former uh, retired uh, colonel from, from the Air Force. I mean, they've, they've contributed to society. I've seen that they're not racist, right? Granted, they're white people and we're all complicit in, in this racism that, that is the structure of institutional and systemic racism, but I've never seen anything bad from them. Their minds, I think, have changed over the last four years of who they would want to vote for now. But we also have to be very, very careful of not having this in the back of our mind that if you are a Trump voter, you are, you know, equivalent to somebody who would have killed Jews during, you know, World War II or something like that. That's a really dangerous track to, 
to go down. Uh, but that said, we should recognize there are people within that contingent that uh, you know aren't just Trump supporters. They are white nationalists. They are Nazis. They are uh, you know people who want to do harm to others. So we shouldn't put them all, I guess, in the same camp as is what I'm trying to say. That there are people there that are good Americans that I think can be swayed, that have been swayed, and I think we you know we underestimate the fact that that maybe a lot of people since they voted four years ago have, have changed their mind. Uh, and that the ones that we're still hearing from are the ones who just happen to be very, very loud uh, because the ones who maybe have changed their mind are a little bit ashamed of what they've done and aren't saying very much. Uh, yeah, there's a whole contingent of Republicans against Trump. It's not just the famous people, it's normal, normal people. They have a whole like YouTube channel where there's hundreds of videos of people that are explaining why they voted for Trump and why it turned out to be a terrible mistake for them personally, you know. And and those are only the ones who are it. brave enough to admit it. That's right. right? That's right. How That's many right. thousands or tens of thousands are, are, are not admitting who they voted for the first time? Yes, that's right. Um, we have a question from Adrian Johnson. She asked, uh, given you are a son of Italian immigrants, what was the organization that you were involved in involved in in explicitly based racial hatred what is their focus now so uh, i was a, a neo-nazi skinhead uh so if we were to think of like the typical you know in the 80s and 90s what we saw as racist like the clan and skinheads i was a skinhead uh and you know Despite the popular belief, uh, they were very accepting of Italians because Italians are also Europeans and, and fought with Hitler during World War II and things like that. So there was never any kind of bias against uh, what people might think were, you know, Italians. Um, what they're up to now, um, well, um, they are much smaller of um, a part of this movement as they used to be in the 80s and 90s. We don't see skinheads as much as we do, um, you know, compared to back then. And that was part of a strategy uh, to become uh, less visible, really. In the 90s, uh, a couple of things happened. So um, if, if you recall, David Duke, who was the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan at the time, kind of dropped the Klan robe, put on a three-piece suit of a politician, ran for president, um, uh, you know, didn't do very well, but it was they, the start of something new. It was the, of what a, a start of what I call this boots to suits mm -hmm. uh, kind of movement uh, where they recognized that even to white American racists, they were um, they were turning them off because they were too extreme. Right. So they started to tone down. Skinheads started to grow their hair out, stop getting tattoos, uh, stopped wearing boots and started, you know, becoming truck drivers and working in prisons and things like that. And and it was this mainstreaming of of the ideology, both in look, but also in language. So some of their words started to tone down. They stopped saying, you know, the Jews run the world and they said the globalists run the world. They stopped. They started to change their language. So it start, sounded more like, um, you know, foreign policy. Uh, and, and instead of racism. Um, so that was part of why we don't see the old groups anymore. It's not necessarily because they've gone away. It's because they've metastasized into something um, that's that looks and sounds more mainstream. Uh, and certainly we're starting to see a lot of that uh, come out in the Republican Party now, because a lot of the language that the Republicans are using is is nearly identical to language that I used 30 years ago that was very blatant, uh, but now they're replacing some of the very blatant words with, with more acceptable words or more hidden words, but the message is the same. Um, the fact that they're polarizing and marginalizing people is the same. The fact that they're talking about people of color and not using the N-word is really the same. Um, you know, it, it hasn't changed much except that they've really kind of dressed themselves up to be, to fool people essentially. Yeah, and it's so weird because they fool some of the people, you know, like it's so easy. Like if you don't use some kind of racial epithet, people mm -hmm. are more willing and open to accept, you know, whatever nonsense that you're saying. Um, yeah, I don't understand that. I personally believe- It's because they're thinking it already and it's just validating what they're thinking. And now that they're not using the N word and they're using something that's more, you know, more politically <laughs> correct, so to speak, that they're suddenly on board with it. They're okay with it. Even though the idea is exactly the same and in the same breath, they'll tell you they're not racist as well. 
Yeah, um, I just want to repeat once again, if you have a question and you're in on our Zoom chat, then uh, go ahead and put it in the chat box with a star star hand up. And if you're on Facebook, you can just write your uh, question in the comment and I'll pick it up. Um, we have another question for um, from Cuthbert. Uh, he asked, uh, did, you, did you grow up with or have friends or go to school with minority people? How were those relationships? So actually, before I joined the movement, um, I, I, had a, I grew up in a neighborhood that was pretty broken up into thirds between white, uh, Latino, and Black. So I was always kind of surrounded by um, diversity. Uh, however, uh, growing up in, in kind of this Italian immigrant family, they were very insular. They were, they lived in a part of Chicago, and I should say that, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, still live here. They, they lived in a part of Chicago that had only other Italian immigrants from the same villages that they came from. So while they were surrounded by all this great diversity, they kept pretty isolated because they were uncomfortable living in a new country and they needed kind of each other to make it through. So it was like their little sub community within another community. Uh, so for that reason, I was kind of um, isolated from diversity. I always had access to it. Uh, and before I joined the movement, when I was 14 years old, I played sports. I was, um, you know, on teams with, with uh, you know, black kids and, and uh, Latino kids, and we were all friends. Um, on the team, but because I was so isolated, I never had the opportunity to kind of be friends with them outside of those events. So there were a lot of things happening where I wish, you know, my parents were a little bit less afraid of, of, of where they lived and how they were living to allow me to do things. Um, so I think that that probably did hurt me a little bit, um, but, you know, I was never, uh, you know, I never grew up in privilege. I never was so isolated from, you know, like living in a white community that I didn't have access to people of color. I think my, we were just so afraid of who we were living where we were that we kind of self-protected ourselves. Uh, so that was very racist looking back that my, <laughs> you know, that my parents did. Um, you know, the fact that they were so afraid of what they didn't understand that they were willing to, you know, kind of isolate themselves was, you know, a, a product of, of white racism. Yeah. Um, and we have a question from Teresa. She asked, I'm finding simply that those who say we need to know what happened before the video are clearly those who believe negative, untrue stereotypes of prejudice. What is being done to dissipate slash dissolve stereotypes in today's world of social media campaigns? And I've been seeing some indoctrinating cartoons. Is satire perpetrating hatred? Perpetuating hatred. And, yeah, and I think we're talking about the Jacob Blake videos. And please, uh, Teresa, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so there's there are a lot of folks saying, well, we need to get the whole story of what happened. You know, uh, you know, we don't see what happened before the video. We don't see what happened, you know, after the video. And to those people, I would say it is wrong for police to kill anybody, uh, whether whether they're guilty or innocent. It is not their job to decide, um, right? Um, you know, I understand self defense, and if you know somebody's coming at you with a gun, that you know. That clearly was not happening from the video. So it is, you know, uh, you know, and we can take this back to George Floyd. Well, you know, he had a 20, you know, a counterfeit $20 bill. Again, I don't care. It doesn't matter if he had a million dollar counterfeit bill and he had been passing them for 20 years. He, it still was not the job of a police officer to deem him worthy of a death sentence. Uh, guilty or innocent or not. So to the people saying, well, we need to see the whole video. Uh, I understand you wanting to get all the facts. I think we should all be in the sense of like, yes, let's get all the information before we start making emotional decisions. But in that case, I would say most of the people doing that are propagandists trying to flip the narrative, trying to flip the story to again, make it the black man who is guilty, who deserved it. Uh, when in fact, no, that is not the case. I don't care who the victim is, nobody deserves that. Um, so, yeah. Yes, that um, can't be said enough. The police, their job isn't to shoot people. We're not paying for that. That's not what we want them to do. Um, I don't even understand why- Even if he was in the process of robbing a bank, yeah, it, 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 he still didn't deserve that. If he was, you know- it, it, yeah, yeah, we we don't get to kill people. Um, 
and and as far as you know it drives me crazy when i hear people or the police you know like they like they get off on all these these charges but um what other job do you have where you can kill someone and then still keep doing your job like there's no not even even sometimes soldiers can't get or away a doctor with it. Yeah, yeah or a doctor what if a doctor just yeah. killed someone like oops you know <laughs> Well, Angela, you're you're former soldier, you're retired, you know, uh, military. You got a lot of training to do that job, a lot, yeah. right? Uh, doctors, they get a lot of training. Gosh, even teachers get a lot of training. Nail technicians, they get more training, I think, than police officers do. Uh, you know, in terms in, in terms of hours, uh, you know, there've been all sorts of studies where, you know, frankly, we have people who are carrying a lethal weapon on their side, uh, are tasked with uh, kind of all this power to make decisions, uh, literally have people's hands in their, people's lives in their hands, uh, don't understand psychology, aren't psychologists, aren't doctors, aren't trained to do this job, yet we put so much faith and trust in them uh, to do that. And we're surprised when they fail. So here's the thing is if we want police officers to have that power, then then they need to get the training to do that. They need to go to school. They need to be psychologists. They need to understand how people think, why they might do the things that they do. And then I would feel comfortable saying you have the power to make decisions, not to kill somebody, but whether you put your hands on somebody to detain them and take their rights away, right? Um so I think we have a long way to go to understanding law enforcement in our country. And I think it started off, uh, you know, really in a bad way hundreds of years ago, where it was essentially at first a way to to kind of corral people of color and people who were not fitting into this white system of power. So I, we have a lot to do. I love cops. I think that there are good cops, but I think that they are uh, they have too much power and they are untrained with that power. And they are normal people who have bad days like us. And we have to understand that we can't put guns in, in the hands of people who also have bad days and can't regulate how they use those feelings. That is true. Um, we have a comment on Facebook and sometimes we get uh, right-wing trolls on our Facebook page whenever we do these live videos. So I just want to address this comment. Uh, sure. This person says, uh, agree, police are not paid to shoot people and to kill, but if attempting to arrest someone who is resisting arrest, what what are they to do? Uh, let the person go? Um, I would say, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, really, what is resisting arrest? You're, you know, because resisting arrest is one of those crimes where the policeman reaches out to touch you and maybe you flinch away. Cause, right. and, and so then it's you're natural. resisting, it's natural. Yeah. Who yeah. wants to have handcuffs on them or who wants to be pinned down with somebody's knee on their neck? Like, well, let me give a more, let me give a more uh, like concrete thing is when police are chasing somebody in a car, they're told to back off because that's a dangerous situation. It could get other people hurt, right? Um, in the, and because they have the license plate and they know that they can find that person later. In the Jacob Blake situation, uh, not only were they there and had witnesses of people who knew who he was, knew his name, knew where he lived, they had a vehicle with a license plate, they knew from registration where he lived, they could have followed him, they had children in the car. It was not a situation that warranted any kind of lethal force to counter it, right? If, if they said he was trying to steal a car, if they said he was trying to, uh, you know, be violent, it doesn't matter, they could have backed off and they could have arrested him later in a different situation. They could have backed off. They didn't have to solve the situation there. Police are actually trained to some degree to de-escalate situations like that. And in that situation, it was not de-escalated. It was actually escalated to the point where they chased him into his car and shot him in the back in front of his children. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't matter to me what he had done. The opportunity to to do something later existed for the police. They did not have to escalate at that situation. Yeah, that is true. Um, we have a whole lot of questions. They're stacking up, so I'll try to go faster. Hmm. Um, all right, we have a question from Maya Buchanan. Um, are you seeing more sympathy towards Black Lives Matter protesters now, or do you think that Trump's law and order mandate is being effective in making good people on 
on both in making a good people on both sides argument and minimizing the efforts of Black Lives Matter protesters? Uh, I think yes to both of those. Uh, I think we are seeing more support. Uh, you know, I think white people are starting to understand uh, to some degree what has been happening and, and don't want to be complicit in it anymore. Um, so that you're seeing a lot of support for, for groups who are, are speaking up. Uh, but I also think that Trump's rhetoric is uh, causing people to have a, a very skewed view of what is happening right now, that BLM are, are nothing but agitators, that you know Antifa are, are these you know provocateur communists who are being paid by you know God knows who to to come in and start trouble. So I think you are seeing the spin happen, uh, and an inaccurate depiction of the groups protesting. I've been to the Black Lives Matter uh, you know protests. I've not seen any violence i've not seen you know and in fact i've seen everybody wearing a mask like it's been very respectful um uh and yet all we're hearing about are you know instances where you know a bottle of urine is being thrown at, at you know right-wing protesters or there's something happening it, it's spin that's happening um and i think you know we need to make sure we don't fall in the trap of white supremacy propaganda spinning what the reality is of what is happening. We need to dig deeper. We need to listen to the voices that are screaming, not just the ones who are telling them to be quiet. Yes, that is true. Um, we have a question from Cuthbert. Uh, which groups do the extreme right hate the most and feel most threatened by and why? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think there are equal opportunity haters. I think that they probably hate anybody who's not a white male equally. Um, hard to say. So what they say publicly is is different than what they say privately. Privately, I would say they they probably blame the Jews the most for for what they think are you know who they think are coordinating this stuff. There are all kinds of you know crazy conspiracy theories that they believe in that people are you know coordinating and being paid by, none of it is true. Um, I would say that they, they hate anybody who's really not a white male with, with, equal, um, with equal hate, but they blame them for different things, um, yeah. Yeah. including white women. I mean, they, they really have no respect for women. They say, they put them on a pedestal. They say they are, you know, we respect women. They're the future of our, you know, of our generation and, you know, they're, these sacred vessels, but really they are so misogynistic, so sexist, have no respect for women or anybody really. Um, and oftentimes that's because they have no respect for themselves. Yeah, that that's kind of obvious. Like a lot of people, you know, all I can say to people, and, and this goes for a lot of groups that people join, um, pay attention to your children what they're doing you know and listen to them listen to what they're saying because a lot of this stuff could be solved by by just a little bit more love from their parents or attention you know that's it's something i don't mean it just it goes for everything like our children are under a lot of influences and especially now with the internet you know and just a little more like positive Positivity from parents goes a long way. You know, we talk about adults. We talk about adults having to have hard conversations with each other. I think as adults, we need to have hard conversations with our children uh, early. Uh, we need to be comfortable having these discussions with our children so, so early, way even before we even think that they're ready for them. Because trust me, they're ready for them. Uh, from the day they're born, we need to start fostering you know, these ideas of inclusion and, and, and things like that. But yes, absolutely, we learn to hate. Uh, we wear it like a protective suit of armor. Uh, and then we go out and we attack. Uh, so we can un absolutely unlearn it as well. But I want to I want to get into a society that is more about prevention of this uh, from ever happening rather than having to clean it up after it's happened. I want to get us to a place where we really are a society that builds uh, from this, this strong foundation from the beginning rather than figuring out how to repair it later on all the time. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Uh, you just Please keep working on that. Um, we have a question from Adrian uh, related to the police force. To what level do you think white supremacists might have infiltrated law enforcement? 
Um, I get this question a lot and I want to be very, very careful. I, I don't think it's like this massive infiltration that every, you know, cop is a secret, you know, Nazi and going to clan meetings. Uh, however, that said, the culture within law enforcement is very geared towards, you know, the idea of the other being lesser than, right? Uh, so we can conflate to a certain degree. Uh, but as far as like white supremacist infiltrating and, and kind of hiding uh, as peaceful law, law officers, it happens. Uh, and it happens more than we think. Um, but it's, it is not, um, uh, you know, I want to be very careful. It is not like some massive infiltration of, of like, we're going to, you know, unmask every cop and find out they have a clan card or something like that. But we should be very clear that the attitudes that they often acquire while they're part of being a law enforcement officer, uh, kind of pushes them to that without them even knowing that, uh, kind of it, it conditions them, uh, to see that color very, very clearly and to treat people uh, of color very, very differently. Uh, so that is something we absolutely need to address and fix. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have a question from Heather. Um, what are your thoughts about white nationalist terrorists that who protested in Portland yesterday? Well, you know, white national, I, I say white nationalism is terrorism uh, because it's, its only goal is to uh, hurt people who are not like them, and oftentimes Americans. Uh, so it is terrorism, whether it's domestic or, or coming from abroad, uh, whether we, you know, we think terrorism normally has brown skin, I hate to say it, but uh, in the United States, terrorism normally has white skin. Um, the ones that, you know, I'm worried about the ones that are out there every day, not just yesterday in Portland. Uh, they're at every rally. They're at every protest. They're at, uh, you know, every demonstration. And there are dentists and there are mechanics and there are lawyers in some cases. There are truck drivers. Uh, there are pilots uh, in other cases. So I, I am very concerned about every instance of a white nationalist or, or a terrorist being among us. Um you know, they gravitate towards these situations where there are protesters because, you know, they're trying to stir things up. They're looking for victims. They're looking to provoke attacks so that they can be victimized. And then, you know, they come there prepared to, to counterattack. Um, you know, this is nothing new. They've, since the Nazis in the 30s, have been going to very kind of liberal, progressive parts of, of Germany uh, to stir up the, you know, the progressives that are there and march through their neighborhoods. They're still doing that now. They're still marching in places like Charlottesville and Portland and Skokie, Illinois in the 70s to try and, and rile people. It is their job to get people emotional to act out in ways that are, you know, kind of illogical so that they seem like they're the victims. That's their whole job is to seem like they're the victims. Their whole mantra, their whole ideology is based on them being the eternal victim. Uh, yeah, you know, um, you mentioned in Germany coming to towns, uh, the neo-Nazis have been coming to my town. They were here last weekend, the weekend before that, and they'll be back next weekend. And uh, I live in a town that's got about 30,000 people in it. And, you know, we have a strong anti-racism coalition that goes out for a counter demo, but this is, it's getting tiring. Like, we, I just want to live in this town. I don't want people, because they're coming from somewhere else to come here and yeah. harass people. It's terrible. Um, we have a question. And it's happening all over the world too. I'm sorry to say, but it's it's not just a problem in our country. This is a problem all the way from you know uh, Eastern Europe and Russia to Brazil. Uh, this is this is something that we're seeing um, gain a resurgence all around the world. The far right, the extreme far right, is building steam. Uh, and they're very good at propaganda. They're very good at being loud. There may be less of them than there are good people, and I do believe that, but they're very good at being loud. They're very good at leveraging platforms to make them seem loud, to, to maximize their pain, uh, you know, to, to make it land on people yes. with, with a whole lot of hurt. They're very good at that. Um, and to some degree, we, we play into it. We let it affect us somehow. Uh, and we, I think we need to be better at that. And I think we need to be stronger minded about who we're dealing with. Uh, you know, we still live in a country where we're, we're debating whether, you know, white supremacy exists. Um, yeah, I mean, I hate to break that one to you, but that's the easiest problem uh, to, to, to say, yes, we have a problem. Um, um, 
Yeah. So I, th I think we are still having, they're very good at keeping us having these conversations of whether this exists or not. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we have to move beyond that if we want to counter it. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have a question from Jane. Uh, she says, in what way is QAnon a part of this white supremacist movement? Good question. Uh, so uh, folks that don't know, QAnon is this kind of, this whole movement of people uh, who believe that um, there is the secret person kind of uh, who is giving, who they believe is Trump in some ways, who is giving these clues about how the Democrats essentially are, want to round up um, patriotic Americans uh, and are supporting this whole idea of like pedophilia and like child sex. It's just, it's hard to explain because it changes every day and it's kind of convoluted. Um, there is crossover. Um, there is a lot of, just in the conspiracy theory world in general. So if we're talking about Pizzagate, if we're talking about QAnon, if we're talking about um, uh, Jade Helm, if we're talking any conspiracy theory that we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years, there is a ton of crossover into the white supremacist world. Uh, but I, I wouldn't classify all QAnon supporters as white supremacists. Um, Although it wouldn't be a, a very hard thing to kind of redirect them into, into that world. The, the prime thing about QAnon is not based on race. It's more based on political party. Um, but it wouldn't be hard to redirect a lot of those folks, you know, by injecting a couple of like anti-Semitic tropes or anti-Black tropes into like, you know, a whole other, you know, conspiracy yeah. theory world. Into the secret clues. Oh my God. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that is... Um... Yeah, that's QAnon is is very extreme. Um, and then we have another question from Adrian. What language do you think would be most effective to counteract the current administration's disinformation campaign? It's moved on from Russian dis disinformation now. Yeah, um, what kind of language would counter it? Um, you know, I don't know that we're at a point of using language anymore. Like, I feel like it's it's got to be emotional now. Um, I think people need to start seeing the impact of this disinformation and misinformation and how it affects people. I think we have to witness it uh, because I think we're so buried under it that it's, it's hard to see through in some cases. Uh, and I think more language um, just doesn't necessarily penetrate. I think eventually we will get to a place where, you know, where we'll, we feel confident in the news that we're, we're getting. But um, I think until we get to that point again, um, it, it has to be an emotional change. It has to be an emotional appeal to people. And I'm not exactly sure how we do that. Uh, if kids in cages, if people being run down in the streets, if people losing their jobs and being evicted and dying of a pandemic isn't change and isn't enough emotion to change people's minds. I'm not convinced yet that we can find enough emotion until it touches them personally. Um, I don't know. This is a tough question. Um, you know, we're in a time when, you know, you can argue all you want and it doesn't matter how many facts you have. You're still not going to be able to reach some people. Right, you were in a time when you can literally parade, you know, kids in cages in front of them, and it's still not going to change their mind. And I and I don't know quite the answer to this, except that we have to start building a society of young people that eventually phases this insanity out, uh, and that is through healthcare, through better education, through access to opportunity on an equitable level for everybody. Because until we change the institutional and systemic racism and problems that we're facing, we are a factory that is going to churn out more of this type of American in the future. Yeah, I just uh, put a explainer video about what QAnon is in the chat and in the comments on Facebook. Um, yeah, it's a really good one. And uh, it's very it's relatively short. So you get the basics if people don't know what that is. It's yeah, when you find out about it, you will find it hard to believe that people are actually, they actually believe this, you know? Um, I And they've caused violence because of it. This yes. isn't just, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, goofy thing to believe in. There have been people who've, who've gone out and murdered police officers, have gone out and, you know, almost uh, shot up a, a pizza place because they thought that there was a child pedophile ring being run in the basement by Hillary Clinton and John Podesta. Uh, there were, I mean... 
people are getting hurt because of this. This isn't just some like, oh, you know, you think weird kind of thing. We must be very, very, very careful of, of this because it's, a, it's not only, there are certain politicians who are QAnon supporters. There are, you know, Michael Flynn uh, took the QAnon oath live uh, over video to his what? supporter. Oh yeah, this was just a few weeks ago. We kind of oh recited the, you know, their phrase. There, there are people running for Congress in, in certain districts who are, you know, very open QAnon supporters. We must, we have to be very, very careful with this yes. as well. So yes. It's so just... it's really important for everyone to vote. If you are watching this and you haven't requested an absentee ballot for the election in November, go to votefromabroad.org. If you're watching this and you're in the United States and you haven't registered to vote or you're not sure that you're registered to vote, go to iwillvote.com. And uh, today's a great day to do it. Um, we have another question. Uh, to what degree is the skinhead slash clan slash white nationalist movement driven by the feeling of shame about their position in society, uh, white trash from the history of non-land ownership rights, et cetera, from the English beginnings of the United States? Uh, whew, good question. I, I think actually very little, to be honest. And I think it's more about sh personal shame versus kind of like more general shame. Uh, uh, but that's actually would be something really interesting to study is from the colonial days, how were poor white people who were also kind of colonialized and part of the indentured servitude kind of thing also more susceptible to this you know pitting of against the other because to some degree racism is very classist right uh you know it is about pitting poor white people i think against poor poor people of color too uh the you know the rich white people uh doing that um i would say it's more about it's more personal uh, I, I, it's less i think um well it, you know the systemic and institutional racism i think churns this kind of you know, American out or can turn this kind of American out. I think it really depends on what that individual person has experienced on that macro level or in their like local um, kind of ecosystem uh, to push them in that direction. That's just my opinion. I don't know. I haven't studied that, but yeah, that, that would be my opinion. I'm sure there's somebody who's doing a study on it now. We have a lot of great researchers that have a lot of great information. The question is, Will it ever be seen by the regular public and accepted as? It makes sense, know. though, Angela. I mean, if you think about it, it you know, in, if we go back five hundred years, right, it would behoove the white, the rich white colonialists, to create confusion with the people that that were under them, right? And whether that eventually was poor or white people or just indentured servants and, and you know, black slaves to, to kind of create chaos among them so that they were busy fighting each other so that the rich whites could still continue to make money, continue to amass power, continue to, to maintain that power. It, it benefits them to create the chaos and to further it along because, then nobody looks at them. They're kind of, they can continue to, to go unfettered and, and, you know, keep that yeah. control while other people are fighting amongst them. Yes, it makes it a lot easier for the wealthy to get away with uh, depriving us all of what is rightfully ours. You know, the riches of this earth belong to all of us together, not just a couple of people who keep everything. That's right. um, yeah. Uh, let's see, here's a question. Uh, do American neo-Nazis have the strong focus on Muslims as in the case of Europe today? Uh, yes, I would, I would think, I, I think that in Europe though, um, they're more vocal about being anti-Muslim. Uh, whereas here, uh, it used to be that way. Certainly post 9-11 was very much that way. I think until about 2016. Uh, 2015, 2016 is really when it shifted uh, here in the United States about who they were kind of railing against more. Then it really became more about Democrats and liberals uh, who were who they claimed were kind of aiding this white genocide, right? They claim that diversity is white genocide, that the whole idea of, of progressives promoting the idea of diversity is essentially watering down their white race that will eventually make it disappear by being outbred and by being, um, you know, in interbred, their words. 
Um, so they're, they're kind of, and I think it was a political reason that shifted because they, they needed to win an election. So I think that there, sh it shifted more away from Muslims, blacks, and Jews towards, um, uh, social justice warriors and the white liberal, I'm putting up air quotes, the white liberal elite who had destroyed America. And that was because they needed to win an election. They needed to mobilize conservatives and Republicans against somebody they would be comfortable Mm -hmm. being vocal against because white Republicans, even if they're racist, weren't comfortable saying, you know, the N word or being against Jews, at least out loud. Yeah. Uh, so, so they, they started saying, well, they will speak up against white liberals because there's no fault out from that. Right. So they started to redirect the kind of ire uh, after once president Obama was elected, that certainly became like their, yes. their MO. Yes. Um, definitely. <laughs> Um, that's something that I don't think, I'm not sure that liberal people or people on the left really understand that, that we're the targets of people now. Like there, it's not that you're black or that you're Hispanic, it's that you are a Democrat. And it doesn't matter what your race is, that we're just in this terrible pot of Democrats and our liberalism and whatever, but be sure be angry if you're angry that you don't have a job. Be angry at all the capitalist business owners. Don't be angry at just like a person walking down the street because we're not taking your job from anything. Um, right. Nobody has that power except the people that run the businesses. Again, um, it's that small percentage of, of rich, typically rich white males yeah. who, are, who are creating this chaos and creating enemies within that chaos to keep them busy with going after each other while they can continue to do what they're doing. This really is about that 1% of the, of the people manipulating the 99% uh, to keep us busy so that they can do what they wanna do. And, and, and it is, you know, the way that they're painting, it's not just about being a liberal or a Democrat, they're painting us as communists, mm -hmm. as anti-American, as, you know, these, these social, you know, kind of these socialist communist and it's 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 wrong right we're we are pro-democracy americans that's what we are right um and they're trying to paint us as the other they're trying to make us they're trying to dehumanize democrats so that it's easy to hate us and easy to make us un-american yes. and that's precisely what white nationalists and white supremacists have done since the very beginning is to paint others as less than human so it's easy to hate and it's easy to murder. It's easy to be violent. It's easy to, de to demean. And it's easy to, to treat them as animals. Uh, and that's what they've been doing since, you know, time began. Yes, that's true. Um, we have a lot of questions, but I have a question for you. Sure. What do you know about this Boogaloo movement? So um, the Boogaloo movement uh, is, and it, it's a some people may have heard about it because we've been talking a lot about it lately and some people may never have heard about it. Um, but it, if we see like these people dressed in Hawaiian shirts carrying like, you know, military weapons and things like that, who are going to these protests, they will call themselves uh, part of the Boogaloo movement. Uh, and what the Boogaloo movement basically is, is a militia. It's what we used to call like the anti-government militia folks. Uh, but now, because it's it's gotten younger, you know, adherence because of the internet, and it's it's driven by a lot of memes and things like that. Uh, you'll see a lot of younger white nationalists starting to kind of gravitate towards that movement. Uh, whereas typically, you know, the militia movements have always had a ton of crossover with white supremacists, but have not been exclusively white supremacists. They've been anti-government for the most part. Uh, but a ton of white nationalists have also been in that camp. So with the Boogaloo movement, uh, we need to be very, very careful. Uh, they are one, anti-government, two, in, in most cases, uh, aligned with the white supremacist or white nationalist movement, uh, but may not necessarily be like white nationalists themselves. Um, so certainly something to be very careful for, you know, this, um, the, the young man, a 17 year old young man who, uh, murdered two people in Kenosha and shot a third person um, would have been what I would have considered part of the Boogaloo movement, which is kind of like this mostly white, uh, mostly, you know, young to, to middle-aged white male kind of Second Amendment militia gun rights kind of person who is at these protests, typically against the protesters that they see as anti-American. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Um, where do American neo-Nazis get their funding? Oh, uh, in many ways. Uh, so from back in, I mean, back in the 50s, we're getting through membership in groups like the American Nazi Party, people were paying dues and groups were making a lot of money because of that. To today where or the 80s and 90s where skinheads were making music and selling music through record labels uh, to nowadays where they're making most of their money online through uh, ad sales. Uh, YouTube was paying them quite well. So if you know their videos were getting a million, two million views, which a lot of them were, they were getting advertising revenue on those things uh, on Facebook, um, you know, on Twitter. Um, now they've uh, and also Bitcoin. They were early adopters because they were so like entrenched in like the the nerd tech world early on. Got really into Bitcoin. Um, so some of them made money in investing in Bitcoin. Uh, and nowadays through uh, subscription services on their websites. They've been deplatformed from places like YouTube and Facebook and things like that. So they've moved on to these other kind of lesser known platforms that allow them to charge subscription services to their, to their followers. So I, there's a, a kid, um, his name is Nick Fuentes. He's a big far right white nationalist kind of conservative. He's not, you know, he doesn't wear a swastika armband. He looks just like uh, Devin Nunez or, or any of these other guys. Uh, and uh, he has, I mean, he's a Holocaust denier. Um, he, you know, makes jokes about Jews being burned in the ovens, but he looks, you know, suit and tie, just like any Republican might. Uh, he's making, you know, between two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year. He's a twenty-two-year-old kid who has a podcast just by people subscribing. So they're, you know, that tells me two things: one, um, they're well-funded, and two, there are a lot of people willing to fund them, which is scary to me. Yeah, that is. And how does someone with the last name Fuentes? call themselves a white supremacist? I am a little confused. Um. Good question. Very, very good question, which brings me back to the point. It is not about ideology so much as it is about a search for identity, community, and purpose and the rewards you're getting from whatever group you find that from. So somebody like Fuentes or even somebody with olive skin like a Picciolini, uh, like me, finds their way into these movements because they're willing to trade um, the reality of things for the reward that they're getting. So Nick Fuentes, despite the last name, is a very white looking young man uh, who certainly has some sort of a Hispanic or uh, Latino background, right, because of the name. Uh, but it, he is their most effective propagandist, so they're willing to trade off on that. They're willing to say, well, he's bringing people to our side, so it doesn't matter, um, which is all shows us, should show us that this is all about hurting other people at all costs for them. Yeah, that the, it is not about you know virtue. It's not about ideology. It's not about anything other than pain that they want to cause. Wow. Um, um, we have a question from Heather. I don't know if it's a question or a statement. Uh, it, she says a march in Skokie, Illinois, was unusual in the 1970s and raised a lot of counter protest. Now it's an everyday affair and to frighten uh, people of color and Jews. Um, yeah. Is that happening? Yeah, I mean, I think Skokie, Illinois, which was a predominantly, still is a predominantly Jewish suburb just outside of Chicago, uh, was the site of a, 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 you know, was a site of a Nazi march in the 70s. It's, uh, you know, subject of a Supreme Court decision and everything. Uh, but I guess the point that Heather's trying to make is since the 70s, I mean, since the 1930s, Nazis have intentionally marched in areas that they know is going to draw attention, right? They don't march in their own neighborhoods because that draws no attention. They march in progressive and liberal neighborhoods, places like Skokie that are predominantly Jewish, places like Charlottesville, uh, that is a predominantly, you know, progressive area uh, of, of, you know, Virginia. Uh, they do it on purpose because they know that people are going to show up and be angry that they're there. They know people, some people are going to be violent towards them because they're angry that they're there. And then all of a sudden they can use that victim narrative to say, you see, we're just about free speech and, and we're, we can't get that anywhere. And you see how they attack us. You see how they're the haters, right? They flip it. They do it just so they can flip it and make the, the protesters look bad. I'm not saying we shouldn't protest. We must. Uh, because I, I don't believe in saying, well, they're going to show up, we should just not show up. No, 
we must show up. We just can't play into their trap. We have to be vocal, we have to be visible, and we have to be vigilant, but we just can't be violent because violence is exactly what they want. What they want, yeah. Um, let's see, to what extent do you think social media platforms like Facebook are complicit in allowing hate groups to exist on their platforms? Here they are allowed to plan, organize, and to build community without pushback. Uh, they are very complicit. And I'll just leave it at that. At that, I mean, they they are, they know it's happening. <laughs> they have the, they've built the technology, so they know how to leverage the technology to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, now, granted, the scale of of companies like Facebook and Twitter and, and and Google are so big that it's it takes a little bit of time to do that, but it also makes no excuse for the fact that they refuse to do it in certain cases. They're a lot like. Um, they're a lot like uh, property managers of really big buildings, somebody like Facebook, right? Like a lot of people live on fa in Facebook world, right? In fact, Facebook is bigger than most countries on earth in terms of population and GDP, mm -hmm. right? And they have a responsibility to those people. And like a property manager, if there's one tenant out of a hundred that is constantly like running up and down the hallways naked, banging on other people's doors, peeing in the hallway, burning down other people's units, you know, threatening people in the hallway or in the, it's the job of the, of the property manager to say, you got to go, right? You can't do that here. That's unacceptable. These are the rules and you have to go. Um, in some cases, they're not doing that. They're allowing people to make mistakes over and over and over and over again without being evicted, so to speak. Uh, so it is their responsibility uh, to take care of these problems. We have a right to use their platforms without being attacked, without being faced with, uh, you, you know, with, uh, you know, verbal attacks or trolling or anything. Like that. And and I think, frankly, it's up to us if we don't like the way that they're running businesses to say, you know what, we're not going to use you anymore, and and that's that. Uh, and then mass, uh, you know, leave these places to be ghost towns. Yeah, I, yeah, but but leave after November third. Right now, go <laughs> right. to votefromabroad.org and request your absentee ballot. Um, yeah. We have a question. Let's see. Uh, this is directed specifically about you, Christian. Um, what got you to leave the neo-Nazi movement, and was there a particular event in your life or a particular person? Yeah, so I spent eight years uh, from the time I was 14, roughly until 23, uh, and there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't question what I was involved in. Um, just to be clear, there wasn't a day where silently uh, I didn't struggle with what I, what I, what I was doing. Uh, unfortunately, the reward I was getting kept me in because I was getting camaraderie. I was getting, you know, this fake respect. I was getting this power when it, I'd felt invisible for, for most of my life. So the reward was more intoxicating. Uh, but along the way, during those eight years, there also wasn't a day where I didn't meet inadvertently or intentionally somebody else who challenged what I believed in. And sometimes they were very effective challenges and sometimes very ineffective challenges. Uh, I could tell you the ones that were the most ineffective that had the most impact on me uh, were the ones where uh, they probably didn't know who I was or they knew who I was, but saw something inside of me that maybe I didn't see in me at the time. Uh, and I'll tell you about two very specific instances where that happened. Um, in 1994, I opened a record store, um, when those still existed, to sell uh, the racist music that I was importing from Europe. Um, but I also sold other music. I sold hip hop and I sold punk rock and I sold heavy metal. It was a small record shop. And I never expected to sell any of that other music. My goal was to sell the racist music and I sold a lot of that. Uh, but people did come in to buy the other music and they knew who I was. Um, and it was a, a one instant, uh, one instance was a black teenager who had come in uh, a lot, never bought anything. Um, and then one day he was always kind of goofy and, and kind of goofing around and funny. Uh, one day he wasn't so funny and he came in and he was very sad. And I asked him um, what was going on because I was still trying to be a good business person, even though I was a racist. Um, I asked him what was wrong. And he told me his mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer that morning. And about a month before that, my mom had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And suddenly I was lost in this conversation with this teenager, you know, who was not that uh, much younger than I was about our mothers. And we'd forgotten about who we were and about how we, you know, thought of each other or whatever. And suddenly, you know, like 
45 minutes had gone by and we're sitting there like, you know, like I had my hand on it. Like it was like this, I didn't know where I was or who I was. So it was moments like that, that challenged me. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it was the compassion that I received from the people I didn't deserve it from um, when I least deserved it, that that was the most powerful thing for me. Um, yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you made it out. Thank really, I, and I, anybody who wants to come out, um, you can go to your website. Uh, what was it called? Free, uh, free radicals .org. Free radicals. Um, But it also, it's very important to Angela to say, you know, people have to be accountable for what they've done. This is not just about, and it was even back then for me, it wasn't just about me saying, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not that anymore. It was about me holding myself to account to make sure that I was being anti-racist, to make sure that what I put into the world didn't uh, add to the complicity of what was happening and holding myself accountable. I still do 20 some years later, every day, hold myself accountable for who I am, what I do, and, and also how I work with other people. I don't give anybody a free pass when I work with them to help them disengage. Um, I create a safe space for them to be able to, to you know, self-reflect, but also to hold themselves accountable for, for what they've done and repair and to move forward, repairing the damage that they've caused. Because until we do that, uh, we're going to still sit in the same place. We must actively repair the damage that we've caused. Yes. Um, oh, this is a good question. Is gaming or what percentage of gaming is the first step that draws in white supremacists online with the gamers lack of success with women and the successful womanizers in the group teaching them how to use women and hate women who they feel aren't equal and are to be hated and used due to the feminist movements for equality, which brings them to leading, leads them to hating all other minority groups, including LGBTQ. Yeah, this is a really important question. So kind of, let me, let me just pare it down a little bit. We're talking about the gaming community, right? And how prevalent is this stuff in that community? Um, let's take a step back from there and, and let's say, let's try and understand who is spending most of their time online these days or just in general, right? Typically it's people who in their youth haven't establish the really close intimate connections with friends, with peers, things like that. Maybe they're depressed, maybe they're struggling with issues that doesn't allow them necessarily to kind of go and have these relationships. So they're finding their identity, community and purpose online or in gaming systems, right? And while it's great, they're having some outlet to, to kind of communicate with people. They're not building intimate relationships because in most cases they're not meeting these people. They're not going into conversations that are very intimate or deep or anything like that. Uh, the gaming community, this is not a statement against games. I believe games are healthy. I think we should, you know, they, there's nothing, even with violent games, I don't think that that's what's causing the violence in society. I honestly think it is the people who are in these environments talking to each other that is causing this problem. So I deal with young people who um, are playing, you know, these multiplayer games with headsets on, you know, and they're talking to people in other places, in many cases, places like Russia or Eastern Europe. And I've seen how the recruitment happens in these multiplayer games. And again, it's not about the games. It's about the people. Uh, the Call of Duty, for instance, there'll be 20 of people playing and they're all wearing headsets and they're all, you know, on the same mission, shooting something up. And one of the people on the headsets will use the N-word, right? And it's intentional. They, they In the conversation, will say the N-word, like get that N-word, whatever. Uh, and they'll gauge how people respond to that. Right. Some people will push back and say, hey, that's inappropriate. Some people won't say anything at all. And some people will giggle, let's say. And oftentimes the ones who giggle or respond are, are usually like 10 or 12 year old kids who really don't know what else to do because they're uncomfortable. But they then gauge the people who've said nothing and have said something and invite them to smaller, more intimate rooms where they ramp up the language, they'll say more. And they'll again, gauge who responds to what. And they keep doing that process until they get to like the third or fourth group and they know they've got a room full of kids who are happy to use the N-word, happy to laugh at it, happy to return it and whatever. And they have now know they have their group of, of, of recruitees, of recruits that they can then ramp up the, the rhetoric to. And it, 
suddenly it's their friends. Those are the people they engage with every day. They go online to meet them every day. They know their names. They share trade memes with each other. They go off into other forums and, and, and communicate. And suddenly that is their group. And that's how gaming is dangerous is because it creates like these, you know, in some ways it's great because you can meet people, but in other ways, if you don't have the ability to really kind of evaluate who you're meeting or you're so desperate to meet people that you're willing to trade whatever it is to, to have that camaraderie, oftentimes you'll find these ecosystems of just this grooming happen. So that's what I'm worried about in terms of gaming. Yes, you know, we could probably make an argument that violent games desensitize us and things like that, dehumanize and, and do that. Um, but I really think that it is, it is the interaction of people on these games that is causing the problem. Um, but not everybody, you know, you, you can play games and, and be just fine. But I, I think we have to be careful of our young kids. It's happening in places like Minecraft. It's happening in Roblox, not just Call of Duty in these places, but places where young people go uh, as young as eight, 10, 12 years old. Wow. Minecraft. Really? Oh my God. That's like a, the, the nicest little friendly game ever. Um, how terrible. Um, to what degree are incels also a part of the white nationalist movement? Again, a ton of crossover. Uh, if we're talking about the search for identity, community, and purpose and, and potholes, you know, in life, you can just as easily find yourself into, you know, this involuntary celibate world where all of a sudden you hate women because they've paid you no attention or because they, you know, you feel that they're getting extra attention, uh, you know, to your detriment, it is, again, this whole world of painting the other um, as less than, right? So it's not much of a shift. And that's why you see a lot of white supremacists who are also in cell. It's not much of a shift to kind of buy into this other very tangential world of, of hating the other. Um, it is, it, you know, yeah. miserable people will find uh, each other. Misery loves company. Yeah, and it seems like the internet which, you know, a lot of people, including myself, thought that the internet was going to be great because it would be a chance for us to meet with people and exchange information. And it never really occurred to me that like sad and hateful and lonely people would get together and like be, gr be grumpy online or whatever you want to call it, hateful, like grousing. I think the internet is a great place. I think it's just being used wrong. I mean, it's an amazing technology that is obviously leveraged in more amazing ways to connect people than, than bad. But I think the way social media has kind of taken over and become the only internet that we, that we know of is, is really become very, very toxic. Yeah, um, here's another question directly for you. Uh, are you or have you been in any personal danger for leaving the movement? I've heard of ex-Nazis having to stay in hiding. I've made the choice 20 years ago to be very vocal about who I was. Uh, it was very important to me at the time, um, but it also came with the notion that I had to be very careful moving forward from then. Um, so I am careful. I get threats all the time, uh, unfortunately, uh, death threats. A lot of times, you know, so every day uh, on social media, things like that. Um, but I'm also not a person who's done much hiding in 20 years. So, uh, you know, uh, I, you know I, I try to be as careful as I can, but I also know that this is who I am. This, this is important to me, that we are in a moment where if we don't speak out against these things, that the danger in the future will be much, much worse. Um, that, you know, once once they've gotten past this kind of like, getting comfortable phase that they will get very entrenched into hurting people right that if we allow them to stay in power they will get very comfortable with taking it to the next level uh, and we can't let that happen uh so I, i'm okay with with uh, you know i also have done bad things in my life and frankly i shouldn't have to escape the fear of that right like i, I there are things i have to hold myself accountable for um you know even if it is coming at me from white nationalists uh, now that, you know, I can't be afraid to move forward on. I'm telling the truth now. Uh, and that to me is very, very important. Whatever it takes to have to do that, I'm willing to do it. Yes, that is very important. Um, what did your parents say about your choice? Well, I think once they figured it out, uh, they were horrified. Um, you know, part of the reason why I 
you know, found that family, so to speak, in the movement was because I felt abandoned by my own. Uh, and that wasn't because they abandoned me. It's because they were immigrants and had to work seven days a week and, and 16 hours a day. And I was too young to recognize that. I just saw that they weren't there. So I went looking for a family elsewhere. Um, so once they, you know, about 15, uh, when I was 15, they started to, you know, recognize what I was involved in and they dropped everything to try and help me. Uh, at that point though, I wasn't interested anymore. I was interested in hurting them, uh, with what I was involved in because I was trying to get back at them for what I thought they did to me. So, um, you know, to some degree it was a little, too little too late, but they also never gave up on me, which had they not tried, I don't know that I would have gotten out to like, that was so important to me that they, that I always had a safe place to land, that they said, we don't care what you've done. We love you. And we want you back. Uh, and when I was ready, I was able to go back and I'm grateful for that. Yes. yes. Parent parental involvement in your children's lives. Please be involved. Um, should the KKK and similar movements be prohibited? Should there be more restrictions on hate speech? Um, I don't, you know, I'm not about putting restrictions on Americans, but certainly there should be consequences to it, right? I think the KKK and uh, similar groups should be terrorist organizations, right? You can join a terrorist organization if you want, but here's the consequences if you do, right? Um, so, you know, of course, we don't want to encourage people to do that. But I think that I think that creating laws on the front end will cause more people to want to do those things. It's a really strange thing. I mean, but, you know, some people are like that. If they can't do it, they'll want to do it more. Um, so I think, you know, putting up an obstacle on the front end is not the best choice, but to say, hey, if you do this, here's what you're gonna have to deal with kind of thing. And that's typically what we do for, you know, for all laws in America. You can steal if you want to, but here's the consequences, right? Um, we're not gonna tell you not to do that. I mean, although you shouldn't, but here's what's gonna happen if you do kind of thing. Um, and I think we do need to, to have, um, in terms of hate speech, we need to recognize that hate speech happens online and that, it, it, you know, it, and it can be a hate crime the same way as spraying, spray painting a, a swastika on a synagogue is a hate crime. Uh, that the intent of spray painting a swastika on a synagogue uh, is is to create fear, to create hurt and pain, right? To make people afraid, to intimidate. If you say you know uh, the Jews uh, ought to die in another Holocaust online to somebody, um, right now that's not really prosecutable as a hate crime, even though it has the same exact intent as spray painting that swastika on a synagogue. So I think we do need to kind of look at, you know, how the internet is, is reality <laughs> today, more so than we, maybe we thought it was a reality five, 10 years ago. It, it really is, you know, things that happen on the internet have the same impact, I think, as they do in real life. So I think they need to be legislated uh, similarly. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I think we live in a country where, if we can lay a foundation, we can create critical thinkers. We just are not laying that foundation. Yes, we have to improve our education system a great deal. Because great deal. For, for me, the fact that QAnon exists and that people are somehow following it, it's like, we're going to give you clues and then you're going to figure out what, what's meant, you know? And like, it just seems like, to me, it just seems crazy. Like. You know, like, like if you were thinking clearly, you'd just be like, get out of here with that, you know, <laughs> and just move on to the next page, you know, um, we are, coming but if, go ahead. But if you're, if your life for some reason you feel is not playing out how it should, or you've hit obstacles and you can't figure out why, and somebody suddenly gives you a reason it's easier to accept that reason, that out of the box reason, if you're going through kind of the trauma of everything or that uncertainty than it would be if things were just normal and somebody came to you with that same kind of conspiracy theory. Uh, people are looking for answers. So when somebody presents it and they can't find it, they're more willing to accept it even if it's crazy. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We all have a lot of work to do. Um, we're coming really close to the end of our time. And I want to kind of end on a positive question. Uh, Cuthbert asked, what's the solution? How do you get groups in conflict to see their common interest and work together for the common good? 
Well, I think we have to start by making sure that the the people with the loudest voice aren't aren't corrupting everything, right? So, you know, in terms of Trump, uh, he is emboldening so much of this with what he's saying, right? And and also with what he's not saying, with not addressing the right issues and not condemning certain things, right? He has a responsibility as the most powerful person in not just our land, but frankly, in in the whole world as the American president to to be responsible, right? Um, there are so many things happening right now that could have been addressed early on, but instead were either not addressed or addressed with plausible deniability in a way that kind of made them continue on and inflame things even more. Um, so that's part of it. That's a big part of it too. You know, in the past, we've not seen this level of frustration because we've always, whether we trusted them hundred percent or not, there always was that kind of voice of reason. Um, you know, to some degree, it doesn't exist anymore. And in, in, in certain ways, that that person who is supposed to be the voice of reason is the voice of of the complete opposite of that. That is empowering, emboldening, and, and inflaming so many of the problems that we're seeing, from QAnon to white nationalism uh, to you know conspiracy theories to um, the you know almost flat out like. People call it dog whistling. I call it a bullhorn because when somebody like me hears, hey, suburban women, uh, you know, we're not going to allow low income people to come to your neighborhoods. That's saying, hey, white ladies, we're not going to let black people move into your neighborhood. Like those are the same types of things we were saying 30 years ago and knew what we were doing. Uh, and if somebody's telling you that the person with you know who's been elected as president, whether legitimately or not, is saying those things and doesn't know what he's saying, I, I would think that they were a fool. Uh, so we this is all very prescribed. This is all intentional. Nothing is happening by accident. And and on the flip side, we need to be very intentional. We need to vote. We need to stop equivocating uh, whether this is uh, you know an accident or not. And we need to say. Is this guy a white national? I don't know. Look at his policies. We need to start looking at what he's done and what, and not just what he's said or what we think he's saying. Look at what he's done. Absolutely. This is the case. We have a person who is working against democracy, who is working against uh, the best interest of a lot of people who are Americans. Uh, and we must not let that happen. Yes, we absolutely must not let that happen. Um, it's very important that everyone vote for Joe Biden not for a third party candidate because that's you just giving away your vote at this point. If we had a different system of government where we had a parliamentary system of government where you could vote for a third or fourth party and then they would get some place in the parliament, but that's not what we have. So yeah, we have yeah. to get rid of Donald Trump because I mean, for many reasons, but he is inflaming racial tensions in the United States. Um, and that's probably not even the best way to put it. He's just a flat out racist and he doesn't care if people get hurt. He doesn't care if the words that he says encourages people. If he tells QAnon supporters, well, I think they like me. Well, yes, they do. But, you know, like, really, you don't have to encourage this group of people. Um, I'll leave you with words from a Republican, actually. Are you better off uh, today than you were four years ago? Yeah. Exactly. And uh, the answer for me is uh, no, I am not better off because I'm constantly worried, you know, and my peace of mind is worth a lot more to me than um, almost anything. Uh, thank you so much, Christian, for joining us. Um, if you ever want to come back, just let us know and uh, you have a place <laughs> at our at our table. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to remind everybody that our the last of our um, fighting white supremacy uh, webinars is coming up on September 10th. We're going to be having Malcolm Nance. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, Russia and how they're awesome. still interfering in our elections and uh, how our president is still uh, still hooked up with them. You know, yeah, absolutely. I if, that will be one that I will tune in for. Malcolm is a great person. You should all uh, tune in for that. And there's so much to talk about 
with the connection to Russia and what's still happening today and how they're furthering so much of the white supremacy that's happening here as well. Uh, November 3rd is my birthday. If you really like this talk, please do something nice for my birthday. Go vote for Joe Biden. That's Thank right. you very much. Vote for Joe <laughs> Biden. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to be ending the live stream very soon. And um, thanks, everybody. And I'll see everybody tomorrow morning with uh, Maya Buchanan talking about uh, voter protection. So have a great rest of your day, everybody. And